Thank you everybody for being here. Um, it's really exciting to be in this like Zoom with people, so many people from like all over the world, like we're seeing, uh, to talk about, um, so the title of this talk is Silencing the Left, Anti-Communist Extermination in the Global South. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, um, just a couple of notes that, um, thank you everyone who's introducing themselves in the chat, please keep doing that. Um, and please also put your questions in there. So we will have introductions from Suchin and from Vincent, and then we'll have a bit of a back and forth and I'll ask some questions. Um, but then we're gonna do like hopefully quite a meaty long uh, Q&A um, from the chat. So if you ask your questions there, we will be reading them and coming back to them then. Uh, you can ask them in English, Indonesian, Spanish or Portuguese, any other languages? This is, isn't it? There's a lot. So, um, <laughs> and um, we, we'll answer them in, in English, um, but like feel free to write in whatever language of those is best for you. Um, and uh, it, it says here, but just so everybody knows, it is recording as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited to introduce um, So Chen Marching, is, who is a senior lecturer in Indonesian at SOAS University in London. She's also a creative writer and award, an award-winning composer of avant-garde music. Very cool. Her latest book is The End of Silence, Accounts of the 1965 Genocide in Indonesia. Her latest novel about the 1965 genocide, Dari Dalam Kabur, Inside the Grave, was published in September 2020. And then Vincent Bevins, who's also here. Um, Vincent is an award-winning journalist and correspondent. He covered Southeast Asia for the Washington Post, reporting from across the entire region, but paying especial attention to the legacy of the 1965 massacre in Indonesia. He previously served as the Brazil correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, also covering nearby parts of South America. And before that, he worked for the Financial Times in London. Among other publications, he has written for are the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Economist, The Guardian, Foreign Policy, The New York Review of Books, Folio de São Paulo, The New Republic, The New Inquiry, The Owl, The Baffler and New York Magazine. Vincent was born and raised in California and spent the last few years living in Jakarta. Um, I'm going to let you both introduce uh, your books and talk for a while about them. Um, so, Vincent, uh, take it away. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Yara, uh, for, for doing this and for that introduction. For those of you who don't know, Yara herself is a novelist from here in London, and I really recommend her first book, Stubborn Archivist, which is about being from England, but also having um, a Brazilian background. And she's now working on a second book and looking into Brazil's dictatorship and in the, in the dark history of the anti-communist violence uh, that me and Su Chen looked at. So, uh, I'm really grateful that, that she was, she's, she's here to do this with us. So as she said, I'm gonna briefly explain what my book, The Jakarta Method is about, um, talk a little bit about how it's been received over the last five months since, since, since it came out, uh, and then pass things over to Su Chen and explain why I'm so glad that she's doing what she's doing and, and why I'm happy that she's here. Um, so The Jakarta Method is a book about anti-communist mass murder that is the intentional extermination of leftists or people accused of being leftists carried out in the service of constructing authoritarian capitalist regimes in the 20th century. And I found um, in my research that in at least 20 countries around the world, allies of the United States rounded up and killed people using anti-communism as their justification. Um, and that this uh, was done intentionally and with a, a, a purpose and, and that this purpose was ultimately, then they were ultimately successful in, 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 in what they were trying to achieve. Now, the most important event in this story, the apex of this anti-communist violence took place in Indonesia in 1965 and 1966, when the US backed military killed approximately 1 million innocent civilians. So as I see it, this was a major turning point in the 20th century. I claim that it was probably the most important victory, uh, in quotes, for the United States and the West in the Cold War, at least according to what they believed their interest to be in the Cold War. Um, though in the Western English-speaking world, we have largely pushed this event sort of into the back of our collective memories, into our collective memory. At the time, everybody understood how incredibly important this was. 
Um, this was the third largest communist party in the world, the largest part communist party in the world, not to have an army and a state um, as the Soviet Union and China did. Um, uh, U.S. officials in Washington all understood in the early 1960s that Indonesia was far more important, important than Vietnam in the Cold War and the battle for Southeast Asia uh, in particular. And when this happened, when the Indonesian Communist Party was decimated through, as I said, intentional um, extermination of innocent civilians, people around the world took note and, and drew lessons from it. So uh, on the left, people came to the conclusion that it was impossible to have a peaceful path to socialism, that you had to um, become self-defensive and armed uh, and rigidly organized and always prepared for imperialist attack if you were going to try to reform capitalism at all. And not everybody took this, um, took this path, but a lot of people drew this lesson from Indonesia in 1965. And then on the right, the side that I believe ultimately was victorious in the Cold War, um, people looked at it in a very different way. Um, far right groups, uh, radical anti-communist groups, allies of the United States, potential allies of the United States looked to what had happened in Indonesia and thought, oh, that worked. It's something we can do. And not only can we do it and succeed at crushing our enemies and, and um, sort of clearing the ground for the construction of our right-wing dictatorship, the United States will help us do it and then they will help us explain it away and cover for us on the international stage after, um, after we're done with this horrible task. Um, and especially in Brazil and Chile, the word Jakarta became used to signify this tactic, this method to kill your enemies, um, more, most specifically by rounding them up, arresting them, and then um, disposing of them without anybody knowing initially what happened. This is a very effective way to terrorize your population. Um, and the this is what the this is where the title of my books comes from, right? This is the idea that it was not just this one case, but it was something that was employed over and over throughout the 20th century in order to construct um, the world that we live in now. Um, and I claim in the book, and I'm claim now that this tactic, this Jakarta method, was such a fundamental part of the way the West won the Cold War that it shaped life almost everywhere on planet Earth to this day. Now, Jakarta was not actually the first time that a U.S.-backed country employed mass murder against leftists. There was um, the immediate aftermath of the CIA-backed Guatemala coup in 1954. There was the, the Ba'ath coup in Iraq in 1963, in which the CIA and Saddam Hussein uh, participated in uh, the, uh, a horrible purge of the Iraqi Communist Party, which was an incredibly important part of the left in the 20th century uh, as well. But I picked this, this, this powerful metonym, Jakarta, to sort of tie everything together for this book, to, 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 to point to this most horrible and most emblematic um, time that this method was employed and, and show mostly all the ways that it affected things afterwards. Um, and, and I trace this from Jakarta over to South America, the creation of anti-communist dictatorships in Brazil and Chile, the creation of Operation Condor, uh, international terror network um, set up with U.S. backing to explicitly, explicitly to eliminate perceived enemies of these dictatorships, and then the export once more of the Jakarta method up to Central America, where it was employed with most terrifying ferocity in the Western Hemisphere. The numbers in Central America started to come close to the numbers in Indonesia, though they didn't quite get there. So simplifying as much as possible, I believe that what happened last century is that in 1945, the end of the Cold War, two things happened. Uh, the era of formal European colonialism ended and the US, era of US hegemony truly began. Um, and then from 1945 to 2000, we saw that this new hegemon, the, the, the most powerful nation, um, by far, the United States, interacted with the global South in a slightly different way than the Western Europeans had over the previous centuries of formal colonialism. But I think ultimately it's right to say that the United States employed tactics, the use of violence and economic force upon the third world that were neo-colonial and imperialist, right? So again, taking the hugest step back possible, I think you have a shift last century in the way the global North interacts with the global South. 
a ship from Western Europe to uh, North America as the site of, uh, of, of, uh, the, the, of, of, as the real seat of power on planet Earth. But the relationship didn't change at its core. And I think the most, in the, in the most horrible tactic or method, the mass murder of leftists is the one that I really center um, in my book. And so that is all a way to start to say that what I really try to do in the Jakarta method is to summarize and globalize the story of 1965, um, to put it into the widest context possible and explain how important all of this is. Uh, I really, uh, for the main narrative, I really summarized an existing um, body of research and, and, and the story that had been established by careful um, uh, academic work over the over decades. I also did interviews in 12 countries to try to humanize the story and to try to fit this, this planetary phenomenon, this loose network of terror that I describe into a story that the average person can read. But I really always want to recognize that the, for the book, especially when discussing 1965, I really rely on the heroic work done by academics and Indonesian activists and survivors of the violence over the last 55 years. Um, what I did was very, very minor compared to what they allowed uh, us sort of newer on the scene to do. And uh, Suchin is all three of those things, uh, an academic, an activist, and family member of a victim um, of the violence. Uh, as far as I know, there are two books in English that recount the stories of survivors of 1965. Um, one is by Bhaskar Wardaya, um, great man, a Jesuit priest in, in uh, Joe Jakarta who helped me. And then there's this one, uh, The End of Silence, that Su Chen wrote um, and has been out for a while in English. Uh, um, and it's just a really important and courageous volume for, for reasons I think that I'll, I'll ask her to get into uh, later in the discussion. Um, and it was a lot easier for me to do my work than for everybody who came before me. I think I really want to make that clear. Um, and we just found out this week that Suchan and I will have the same publisher in Indonesia. So, the, um, and, and, and I think that's interesting because uh, her new book, uh, Dari Dalam Kubur, uh, From the Grave, or From Inside the Grave, uh, was going to be published with Grab Media, the, the largest commercial publisher in Indonesia, but then she had problems with what would be allowed to be published by someone like that. And uh, eventually she went to Margin Kitty, which will also publish the Jakarta method. And I think that story of why Gramedia really, I don't know if it was intentional or there were, it was fear or uh, foot dragging, uh, made it very difficult for her to even publish a novel that speaks about what happened in 1965. It's a really powerful reminder of how much the story is real and how much it's not over in the fourth largest country in the world by population. And so then finally, one thing about the way that uh, I've seen my book received over the last five months, um, I've been incredibly like grateful and surprised and gratified to hear people tell me that they actually read this thing either in the United States or around the world, uh, that people enjoyed it, which is a strange way to describe it or found it moving or that they found it accessible or, or that it moved quickly. All these things were really great to hear. But I really always want to stress one thing, and is that this is not like some disembodied, fantastical tale from a faraway land uh, that uh, that exists in some other universe. It's not some sort of uh, um, magical part of the world that we've conjured up to tell this story that doesn't affect people now. It's very real thing. Um, the, the people that have suffered are still suffering. And there's tens of millions of people that I believe still do not have the justice that should have been delivered to them in 1966, let alone 2020. I'm not sure if it will ever happen. Um, these are people I talk with all the time. These are people Su Cheng knows. This is her family. So I'm really happy that um, Su Chen continues the work that she's doing very bravely and that she's here um, today to maybe hopefully uh, help make it real again um, uh, for those uh, that are new to this story. So, so thank you to her, and 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 hopefully now she can talk a little bit about what she's been up to now. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Vincent. I know uh, some of you haven't read Vincent's book, so I'm going to show it here. This is the Jakarta method. 
And I know this is not an academic book, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you why this is in a way, uh, you know, it's really, really important because for an academic book, usually you have to be quite specific, yeah, talking about a specific thing. Whereas Vincent doesn't have to do that. So he can talk about something in general and relate a lot of things. So we can see the connection between one, what happened to one country and another. And I think this is, this is the, the, the plus, yeah, the, 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 the plus of this book, which you may not be able to find in, um, in academic books. Yeah? And, and that's why this is really important. So please, if you haven't read it, please read it. And for people in Indonesia, if you have problems, uh, I know I, I can see some people here are from Indonesia. If you have problems reading English, this will be translated in Indonesian soon by uh, Marjin Kiri, which is my publisher as well, publisher of my book. Now, um, first I'm going to talk about a certain term, which is quite important. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, good. Okay, now, some people actually ask, you know, this genocide happened like 50 year, over 50 years ago, over 60 years ago, over 40 years ago. But why you talk about it now? Yeah. Why didn't you talk about this before? And that's why I'm going to explain about declassification. And this is why we start talking about this now. So declassification is, oops, sorry, is a pro the process in which documents that used to be the, to be classified as secret are revealed under the principle of freedom of information. Not all documents are revealed, of course, only the ones selected by the government in power at that time. The rules of declassification vary from one country to another. In the UK, every 30 years, some documents have to be declassified. In the USA, some documents have to be declassified every 10, 25, 50 and 75 years. Now, the year 2015 is 50 years after 1965, the year in which the genocide of about one to three million left-wing people took place in Indonesia. Why did I write here one to three million? Because no one can be sure how many were murdered. But I mentioned one million here because one expert estimated it's one million, but I wrote three million here because the commander, the main commander of the mass murder mentioned that he murdered three million people. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to show you one of the documents that has been declassified. In 2015, there were 3000 pages of documents that were declassified in relation to like this left-wing genocide here. Yeah? And um, this is just one of them. I didn't acquire this myself, by the way. I got this from Brad Simpson, who, um, who testified in the 1965 uh, International People's Tribunal, uh, which happened in uh, November 2015, and I was involved in it. And he gave me one of these, yeah, only this, he gave me only about two or three, but he, he has like hundreds and thousands of them. Okay. So if, if you think that this is, this, that, this, this is not a clear indication, it's because it's only one, there are thousands of them, but you can see here just to show you this one. Yeah. I'm going to read it. Number one. If we pursue the wait and see policy announced in CRO telegram number 2514 throughout the period of the current internal struggle in Indonesia, we may well be missing a golden opportunity to turn events that we, that, the way we want. It seems to me that all we're doing is holding off to allow Sukarno to settle his own internal troubles so that he can re-emerge strengthened by quelling internal dissidents and pursue his confrontation with renewed vigor. One can almost hear the speeches already, and I expect the inspiration of recent troubles will undoubtedly be put out as coming from the Nekolim. Now, is this what we want? 
I strongly advocate that we should take a much more aggressive line to try and ensure continuing civil war in Indonesia. Our aim being the destruction and putting to flight of the PKI by the Indonesian army. The PKI is the Indonesian Communist Party, by the way. Sukarno, by not seizing the opportunity given him, has clearly shown that he doesn't want to break with the communists. Are we going to sit back and allow him to succeed? If we do aid it, aid it, it, we, it will make sure it comes off properly next time, okay? So I believe we have everything to gain from early and careful planned propaganda and cyber activity to exasperate uh, internal strife and blah, 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 blah. So you can see this from CINFE, yeah, America to uh, MOD, UK. Yeah, so you can see it. Now, this is just one of the documents that has been declassified, and that's why we know now how far was the involvement of the United States and also other Western countries like Australia and also UK and also um, some European countries like Germany and the Netherlands and, and um, also Denmark. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about my book a bit today, actually. My book actually shows how the event that happened over 50 years ago still have impacts today. So my book is not only about the accounts of the victims, but also their siblings, children and grandchildren. But the desire to write about this or anything related to the 1965 genocide had started far earlier, actually, because my father was one of the victims, like what Vincent said. However, my mother kept asking me not to write about this. Her trauma of witnessing her husband being dragged from our home by Suharto's troops one day in 1966 makes her believe that silence is a virtue. Unfortunately, I'm the other way around. I keep talking and, and, and for my mother, I'm just like a broken record. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we have quite a lot of arguments about this actually. And my mother is supported by my elder sister in this case. And recently she scolded me again, by the way. So, but the terror continues. When I interviewed my respondents, what I discovered was the terror from decades ago still lingers to these days. Suharto, the president of Indonesia who was installed by the US government and was arguably involved in the massacre, stepped down in 1998 and died in 2008. However, the cronies are still in power in Indonesia. Over half a century after the genocide, the term communist is still used today to vilify people, communists equate with evil and atheist in Indonesia. And by the way, I know for some of you, atheists are fine, but not in Indonesia. Yeah, I, atheists are not fine in Indonesia. What I witnessed when I was interviewing my respondents was, was the internalized fear. Out of fear, the victims have become the hands of the authoritarian regime, helping to sustain its ideology. The state does not forbid these people from writing because the banning is already there, internalized, psychologically embedded and personalized. And this is what happened to me as well when my mother said, no, don't, don't you dare talking about this at all. That's what she said. And my elder sister said that. And, oh, my, by the way, my brother too said that too. Yeah, forgot to mention him. But anyway, only a few are willing to open up. And my respondents who decide to reveal the truth often had to face resistance, not from the government this time, but from the people close to them who fear that future disasters might befall them. I do not say that the government and the people in authority have no impact on the lives of these individuals. However, the long terror and draconian rule in Indonesia had huge impacts on the mind of the people. And that's what I've, I, I've been arguing. Several of the memoirs I've gathered depict how the parents and the children from getting involved in politics or challenging the government. Siblings ask their brothers or sisters not to get involved in my project and some grandparents for, want the family to never speak up. So even the people who, who actually um, 
who, who were willing to be interviewed by me said to me, don't tell my family, okay? That I, I, I tell you this. Sometimes they said that. So fear produced by the state seems serious and obviously threatening. However, there is another form of fear, the fear internalized within the family. Many of these people who forbid others to speak up have also been victims of the 1965 atrocities. Such mutation of fear is very effective and inexpensive confederate for maintaining the power of the of despotic, de, uh, despotic rulers. Sometimes the victims even blame each other. They blame any effort of the, to reveal what happened to them as dangerous, stirring up trouble and chaos. They serve to maintain the ideology that led to their pers uh, persecution, actually. So um, they just, you know, like what my mother said to me, you know, it's, it's not like I ask you to shut up, but I love you. Yeah. So don't do this. It's because of love. And that's what I've been hearing from them. It's because, because of care, because of love, because they care about their members of the family, so they must shut up. So this is the internalized fear and it mutates to become something else. Yeah. And the impacts, the inability of victims to communicate well amongst each other, even the victims blame each other, and also with their family members. Yeah, the, 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 there's always tension between the victim among the victims and within the victim and the other family members. So it's quite complicated. And secrets upon secrets for decades, even to the present. So of course, suspicion and tension are quite high. Even now, many survivors and activists are still threatened. And when people feel threatened, they tend to see others as either friends or foes. And to protect themselves, they tend to discriminate as well. And no wonder, yeah, racism and discrimination persist in Indonesia because of this. So my experience is somehow a kind of a replica of what Vincent describes in his book about the operation of the US government in exercising its power around the world to beat communism. So in this case, the US government just, you know, stirred up problem here and there. And um, it's quite effective. They does not have to send their troops to different countries. And uh, those countries did whatever the US intended by themselves. So it was very efficient, yeah? The, the US just, just basically instructed them to do whatever they had to do. And then that's it. Yeah, the coup happened. The genocide happened, the murder happened, and then the governments sponsored by the US in several countries suddenly. And the US government can somehow sit back and relax, not quite like this, but somehow, you know, sit back and relax. And if necessary, they can say, oh dear, look at what these uncivilized countries have done. Yeah, they were murdering each other. What kind of society is that? And this is the question that people ask me after they saw that film, um, The Act of Killing. What kind of society is that? Well, yeah, but who sponsored them? <laughs> it's not just the society. You have to see the wider picture. And that's why the Jakarta Method describes this really well. Yeah. Although in a much more, it's in a, in a much smaller scale, one of the victims in these huge political upheavals and incidents is my novel. Six years ago, I interviewed several people for my book, The End of Silence. One of the women I interviewed said to me, I will tell you as much as I can about myself, but please do not publish it. With her consent, I published a story in my novel because I thought this, this is just too important to just ignore. Yeah, she, she told me that um, she was raped, basically. She was raped by the New Order troops and then she got pregnant and she had to bring up the baby together with the other children. Yes, yeah, so, and of course, it has caused quite a lot of complication in the family. 
and I just think this 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 has to be known by the people. So I ask a consent. I said, look, I'm going to give you um, a pseudonym, yeah, fake name. I will change your details and I will publish your story in my novel. And she agreed. She was actually um, she was quite proud of it actually, but even in fictional form, her story still underwent a long struggle. Yeah. My novel was first accepted for publication by the biggest publisher in Indonesia, Gramedia, at the end of 2018. However, a few months later, the publisher told me that some details had to be altered or even omitted because of the sharp criticism against the Suharto's cronies. So you, you can see it had to struggle, yeah, even in fictional form. Um, I was bargaining with Gramedia for months, nearly gave up because I was tired of it. And in the end, I had a chat with um, Majin Kiri, a much smaller publish pub publisher, but they promised not to censor my novel. And that was more important for me than being published by this biggest publisher in Indonesia more prestigious you know some some of my friends said oh no 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 you shouldn't go with a much small publisher Gramedia is the best you know everyone wants to be published by Gramedia and I said no but it's more important for me not to be censored yeah so in the end I went with my Jinkiri as I was writing my novel actually that woman once told me her hope that one day it would be safe for her to reveal what she has inspired that that she has inspired my novel she was actually quite proud of it yeah she was like <laughs> at some point she kept asking me so when are you going to finish my novel i just started at that time and she already asked when i'm, I'm going to finish it so I'm like it will take a few years <laughs> i said so please be patient and at that time the president of indonesia jokowi promised that oh we will um um, you know, deal with the human rights violation in the past, which he, in the end, he didn't do. Yeah, of course, he hasn't done anything much, to be honest, about the, the past human rights violation. But at that time, this woman had a lot of hope. And she said, you know, probably one day I could be more open. Unfortunately, this is not going to happen because she passed away before my novel was published. Before I finished my novel, she passed away actually. And yeah, so it's, it was really sad for me. And another thing is this morning, about five hours before this discussion, four or five hours, I had a um, discussion about my novel. Yeah, about this uh, Dari Dalam Kubur with the Indonesian people. And it was hacked. So it's still happening. Yeah, it's still happening. The terror continues. It was hacked just this morning. So that's all I'm going to say. And um, you can ask me questions, Vincent, if you want, and I will ask you questions later, if it's okay with you. Yeah, great. That sounds, that sounds great. I'm going to stop here now. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I want to, yeah, like you said, I want to respond to a couple of things. Yeah, I want to say two things about uh, what Sujin just said. Um, one, I'm really thankful for her to show sort of the, do the documents and explain all how much we really know now, because outside of, you know, outside of Indonesia, it's kind of been established for a while that the case is really clear. But in Indonesia itself, you still have to really fight and be like, no, 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 look at this. It's right there. The United States government published these on their website. It is, it absolutely happened this way. Um, and it absolutely had the full support of the United States. In my book, I pick sort of a, a, a select few of the ones that I think will be most like impactful or get the point across. Um, the best, for example, like right after um, the, uh, the clash, uh, the sort of the confusion of the September 30th movement starts, um, the US ambassador says, about the chance to crush the Indonesian left, it's now or never. Um, and then they get detailed reports, uh, encourage in very clear, ter clear terms, the continued um, use of horrible violence against the Indonesian left. Um, but like, it's, we have to keep saying it over and over, even though it's just undeniably clear. And just 
to share something from one of those other academics that I said that I rely upon so much to do the sort of simple introductory work that I do in Jakarta Method. Uh, we had a talk with John Russo the other day who just came out with a new book. Um, uh, years ago, he, he published Pretext for Mass Murder, which was probably the best attempt at an account of um, the September 30th movement that led to the mass murder. And he's come up with a, a, a new um, book called Buried Histories. Um, and he was asked in one of our events the other day, okay, but if you had to explain why this happened, why did they kill all these people? If you had to give the simplest answer possible, what would you say? And John Russo said, the Indonesian military did it to impress the United States, to show the US government that they were serious about building the type of society that they believed the US wanted them to build. And they were right. Uh, it did impress them and they did get the aid that um, they were hoping for. Um, so while there are undeniable, and, and John Roos is very careful and very academic in the way that I'm not um, at, uh, at, at, at identifying all the things that made it possible, all of these um, fights over land, fights between the Indonesian left and, and, uh, and the military, um, all of these political struggles from 1958 to 1965, when asked, okay, but in, in the simplest terms possible, what, why did they do it? The answer is the United States. Um, and another thing I'm really thankful to Su Chen for is that her work is really um, effective in demonstrating something that I think is really familiar to people that have lived in countries that have had dictatorships, but people, those of us in like the privileged, uh, you know, democratic West have a hard time understanding is that the terror of 1965 and 1966 succeeded in forcing the, Indi the citizens of Indonesia to reproduce lies and propaganda, even though they knew, even when they knew that it was not true, right? It, it, the, the terror was so effective that people either shut up about things they knew or said, they th said things they knew that weren't true. And this is an essential dynamic of the worst the worst um, authoritarian regimes is that the citizens are not only victimized by it, they're bas it's basically help me victimize or be a victim, right? Like you, you and, th and this happens also, you know, in there was this dynamic in the killing itself, a kind of kill or be killed, right? Like get on board with this mass roundup of leftists, uh, sign off on what we're doing, or you're gonna be very quickly accused of being a communist yourself and then you could be next and, and to in a you know it's not as extreme now people you know but something like that is still at work right it's still very easy the last thing you want if you're an Indonesian and not privileged like me to live just like you know if you live in Indonesia but you can't just run away like I I can you really do not want to be accused of being a communist or by, by anybody mm. uh it's really going to mess up your life mess up your family's life and this is why a lot of people that I spoke to for the book didn't want to talk and that was fine. I found the people that that um, did want to talk. And, and she mentioned on one part of this propaganda story, which was especially egregious and especially racist, that was also reproduced with the help of the uh, Indonesian elites and the media in the region. This idea that like, oh, well, that's just what they're like over there. Like life is cheap in that country. They're violent. They do that to each other, which mm -hmm. is has no basis in historical reality whatsoever. This is not happening beforehand in Indonesia. It was not just like a mass um, uh, war of everyone against everyone. Um, and that kind of racist stereotype was used in the New York Times all throughout the Western media to wave away what was actually the US backed and coordinated mass murder of approximately a million innocent people. And as Stu Chen says, could have been 3 million. Uh, Sarwadi Di said that it was, we don't know. And the, re the, the and I think the fact that we don't know is really tragic and telling, right? Because the reason we don't know is because there was never a massively funded, internationally recognized truth commission that mm. there could have been and should have been, right? The fact that we have to guess is is quite tragic in the first place. And in my own really small way, I like felt what it was like or saw what it was like in Indonesia for people that could maybe be accused of being on the left. And I'm gonna tell this story just because I saw one of the uh, one of the participants in this reading group is in the, the call now. But um, when I first got to Indonesia, because I'm American and had a journalist salary being paid for from the United States, I could afford a pretty nice place. Um, it was, and I know I'm not liking it that much, but some of my Indonesian friends had a political theory reading group 
where they every week they would meet to read um, sort of the big works of political thought. Because some of those books were Marxist, they were afraid that they were going to be discovered by the police and get in trouble. So they had their meetings at my hotel because for, you know, it was bit, one, it was big enough, but also because they said, hey, you're white and this is like an expat like neighborhood. It's way less likely the police are going to bust in and arrest us for reading sort of like Hegel and, and Adam Smith and Marx or whatever. So uh, it is very real, even if you're, you know, even if you're in sort of the Jakarta elite, even if um, you didn't have any direct connection to the people that were victims, and a lot of Indonesians did have, do have direct connections because about a third of the country was somehow affiliated with the Communist Party in 1965. But it's very much alive. Um, and I don't know exactly what is going to happen next. And that's where I, how I want, how I want to throw it back to Suche. And I want to ask you, do you think there's a chance that this situation can be improved in the near future? What do you think will happen? How and when, if ever, will Indonesia sort of recognize officially, nationally, the truth of what happened and, and allow for people to, to tell the truth about what their lives were up until 1966? Do you, what, what do you think the prospects are, Suchen? I really can't answer that because, you know, uh, when Jokowi first got elected, I had such a big hope because he promised that he would deal with um, past human rights violations. And he promised a lot of things, yeah, uh, to, to, um, to, to us, to activists. And we, we were actually, um, we were, were really positive about him at the beginning. And in the end, perhaps he realized that uh, to hold on power, he has to be kind of like polite and nice and sweet to these new order cronies. And that's what he's done. Yeah, to hold on power, that's what he's done. And he hasn't kept his promise at all. And um, the sad thing is uh, people, people are still being terrorized in Indonesia. And only last year, uh, when I was back to Surabaya and we held a meeting with, um, with the um, ex-political prisoners and the families, some fundamentalist group came and disband our meetings, the police was there and said, oh, you have no, you know, you have no rights to have this meeting uh, and then you have to go home, you know, and it was only last year. And recently my friend told me that it happened again. And also with my novel, like this morning it happened. And this is the sad thing because there, there's still, you, you know, the, 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 the victims and their families are still being terrorized. And, you know, many of them, still live in poverty yeah i am so don't think that i'm i'm i'm, I'm typical <laughs> typical <laughs> you know <laughs> family member of victim i'm i'm probably one of the very lucky ones and i experienced poverty as well when i was young my family was really poor as well and um my my sister told me that they they even had to struggle just to eat, yeah. I was born after my father uh, was released from the prison, so I'm one of the luckiest in the family. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the luckiest in in that I could I could um, eat properly. <laughs> I could the, the, yeah I could eat properly since I was quite young. But my brother and sister couldn't eat properly when they were young. Yeah, so many of them are still like that. Many of them are still. Uh, are still suffering a lot and and they still sometimes find it difficult to find jobs because of the stigma if people find out that they are oh they're related to this communist party it's still hard for them to find jobs but i have a lot of hopes um for the young people because more and more people now start questioning the history because they there are more books and they read more books they read the alternatives, so I think they start questioning it. Yeah, and, and if more and more people start questioning this history, eventually it will change. I don't know when, but I can see it now that more and more people start saying this history is rubbish. Yeah, so it is not as bad as before. People still scold me and threaten me, but it's not as serious as before, because before it was really serious. 
Yeah, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, definitely. And I would just add one more thing before Yara uh, maybe jumps in with her questions is that um, that poverty, uh, it's still the, the, the condition for a lot of survivors, right? So the, pe the people that I spent a lot of time with, I spent people, some people all over the place, but in Solo, for example, I've been for a long time trying to organize sort of a big attempt to raise money for the whole, all of the survivor organizations. But like, I've gone too slow because the people that I know in Solo have twice been like, hey, we need money now or we won't be able to feed, um, distribute like rice and oil to people during the pandemic or we're going to run out of, rent for this like incredibly cheap little base that we have our meetings in so people can these people can feel connected to each other so um it's 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 really people that are living with this every every single day um yeah what, what, what do you have any thoughts or, or questions here yes um i want to come back to the uh question of poverty because i think it's part of both of the texts and kind of emblematic of the different approaches you take so um, Vincent, in your appendix, you have the big tables which show relative wealth of different countries. And um, so, Chen, you have um, these accounts where so so much of what the people are saying is about food. Um, it's actually remarkable. Um, but I want to come back to that. And first, um, Vincent, I was just wondering, given that there are a lot of Indonesians and Americans uh, on the call, maybe you could summarize uh, what happened in Brazil in 1964 and also just like give some background on that so that like we just know what's going on. Yeah absolutely so that's the other big um, coup and the other big event that I claim in the book is one of the most important of the Cold War and there's a lot that is really similar with Indonesia some some that is I think so similar that it's suggestive of some kind of relationship but again you know uh i i we don't know there's so much we still don't know um but the short version of the story is that in 1964 there was a center left left leaning a little bit of president of brazil uh, that was overthrown by the the military with the support of the united states and the brazilian military had unlike the indonesian military a very long history of anti-communist, um, almost belief systems, almost kind of like an official religion for the the, the Brazilian military, going back to the 1930s. Um, and their coup, which started basically on a um, 1962 phone call between Pre President JFK and his ambassador, you can listen to that phone call if you want. Um, where he he tells the U.S. ambassador to get the the, the Brazilian military um, to let them know that they can start or laying the groundwork for a coup if the left gets out of hand. Um, this is eventually what happens. Um, th that coup that actually comes together in 1964 is kind of like one of the most fully successful and finally. Um, um, and final, I suppose, uh, coups of the of the early Cold War because the middle class supports it, the military fully gets power, um, and the the they don't the United States is not even really required to show its hand, right? So the United States in something called Operation Brother Sam has authorized now under Lyndon Johnson because John F. Kennedy has been assassinated, um, authorizes the. Uh, military assistance to Brazil, but it's not needed. Um, and this, I think, is one of the uh, the key turning points where Brazil uh, shows, like, the best way to do a coup is to really have hegemony in the in the military and to get some section of the local elite really on your side, rather than sort of crashing in there and and and, and throwing everything from side to side like they did in Iran and Guatemala in 53, 54. And the reason this comes back into the book with Indonesia is because it is in this early 70s during the uh, presidency of Salvador Allende that both Brazil and Chile, um, ex uh, in both those countries, you see the use of Jakarta to, to signify uh, the mass murder of leftists. And this is important because Brazil at that time, Brazil didn't just sort of receive a coup imposed upon it from the United States and then just sit and be a, a compliant partner. They were very active in South America in flipping other countries into the anti-communist camp. Um, so Bolivia and Uruguay um, were, were sort of, uh, uh, they had some involvement in, in the establishment of dictatorships there. And then 
when Allende was in power, they were really active behind the scenes with the Chilean military to make that coup possible. Um, so when these, we, when, so it was, is that point where the Brazilian story and the Indonesian story kind of come back together again and lead to the creation of Condor and the mass murder network that very much unlike Indonesia was eventually sort of revealed and apologized for and the victims got some kind of justice, right? This is one thing that was really interesting when I spoke to, uh, still speak to Indonesian victims is that they can't, they're always sh often shocked to find that formerly imprisoned guerrillas or leftists in Latin America came back and had some role in politics. This is something that was totally aborted in Indonesia um, to this day. But uh, yeah, as you said, um, uh, po poverty is a big condition of that, um, of, of that to this day. And, and Suchen does, pays, pays more, I guess, more granular attention to that than I do, because I try to do this, I try to make this really huge point where Here's the 25 biggest countries in the world before the Cold War starts. The same countries afterwards. How many of these went from third world or you know uh, uh, underdeveloped to first world? Zero. And the only countries that did, uh, you know, just outside of that, um, you know, they're not in the top 25, but they're close. Are Taiwan and South Korea, which had the explicit support of the US in sort of giving it exceptions to the rules of the game as everybody else in the global South experienced them. Um, thank you, that's hopefully like gonna give some good context for people who don't know uh, or understand the history. Um, and having your book side by side, I really appreciated, I wanna to talk to you about kind of how you put your text together and how you decided like what, how you would tell the stories that you wanted to tell. Um, and for those people that haven't read both or either of the, of the books, um, they, um, Su Chen hasn't sort of, she has not, uh, not acknowledgements, but an apology at the start, which I think is very interesting. And it's an apology to your mother, which is something you've talked about before and the choice you made between being um, a good activist and a good daughter. Um, and you also have a timeline which lays out the events um, of the 30th of December and the 1st of October and then a few months after that. Um, uh, and then you have largely these oral histories, um, including from yourself. Um, and you approach them and cluster them in kind of relational terms. So the survivors, their siblings, their children, their grandchildren. Um, and again, like you jump in and tell me uh, if I'm summarizing correctly, but what's really, you pay a lot of attention to the trauma and the fear and the psychology, which I think is really important, particularly in a situation where it's been repressed and also weaponized. Yeah. Um, whereas what Vincent does is you have this sort of zooming out, which I guess is incredible. That, I mean, both of your texts could only have been produced by each of you in some ways, right? Because Vincent does this thing where you zoom out and you connect these two stories, which you're able to do because you learn Indonesian and you speak Portuguese and there are presumably are not that many people who can do that um, and although you have different people's stories woven in you also have a lot of um, information about uh, the CIA and the sort of like Americans who are personally involved the CIA guy Frank Wisner and the ambassador in Indonesia Howard, jo Howard Jones so I guess my question is um, I think these two approaches are really complementary um, and particularly important when you want to understand what people's experiences are, but also be able to trace the, I don't know, culpability, but also like be accountable um, for these larger forces. So you're not just saying like, how do these people get so uncivilized? Why are these people so uncivilized and doing this to each other? Um, so how did you decide what kind of text to write? Like what responsibilities did you have? And then how did you like manifest those in the texts that you created? Okay, so basically um, how I choose respondents are just whoever was willing to talk to me. Yeah, whoever was willing to tell their stories to me. That's all, because not everyone was willing to do that. And, um, and actually some people who were willing to do that, they, they, they were actually, some of them are really, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they have the spirit of telling the truth because they said, if not now, when else? 
Yeah, it's it's been over 55. It, it, well, I, I did it five years ago. So there's a, it's already all, um, uh, half a century after that. If we keep quiet, then the lies will continue. And that's that's what I feel. And that's why I, I insist on on doing what I'm doing, no matter what, no matter what people told me, it doesn't matter if they scold me, if they threaten me, it's going to be useless. That's what I'm going to tell them. Yeah. If you threaten me, it's useless. Sorry, you're wasting your time. Because what I believe in is if I don't speak the truth, it's not going to happen. I have to do it. And with this position, you know, as I said, I'm one of the lucky ones. So I feel that I have the responsibility to speak up. Otherwise, I'm going to be betraying other victims. It's going to be such a betrayal to other victims if I don't speak up. So no matter what, whatever the risk is, I'm going to keep going. That's all. And um, yeah, so the way I organize the book is uh, first, um, uh, I, I write about the victims. And then after that, the siblings. Yeah, and then the children and grandchildren. So. Um, I, I organize it so it's it's from the, um, the the earlier one to the most recent one, and as you can see, the terror doesn't actually diminish. Even the grandchildren still feel the terror, and as you see, the uh, one of the grandchildren there uses a pseudonym. She said, "Yes, interview me, but use a pseudonym." you know, publish my, my, my story, but use the pseudonym. So she's still frightened. She's still really frightened. And my mother is one of the examples. She's still frightened. And I can understand it. Yeah, I can understand if she's still frightened. But it doesn't mean that I have to stop. It doesn't mean that I have to be frightened as well. I refuse to be frightened. And that's all. Yeah, Su Chen, Su Chen touched on something that uh, for sure I, I felt as well. I felt like a real burden of responsibility to these people that like once the people had told me, OK, I want to do this. This is my story, um, you know, and then trusted me to go out and like write this book for the English speaking world. Um, and they knew, you know, they knew like, oh, okay, well, this guy, he has like some affiliation with these American newspapers. So maybe that's why people will pay attention to him. Um, I felt like a real, <laughs> a real moral responsibility not to get it wrong. And um, so I was really careful in selection and also um, like very much willing to like go <laughs> to... Like, not that I had to fight with the editor or whatever, but there were certain things I was like, no, 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 this needs to be explicit. So we can't soften this. Um, and um, and I think that relates to the question you asked me sort of more directly, which is, you know, how did you, how do I weave this together, put it together? So I hadn't done something like this and I wasn't quite sure that it was going to work at all, but I knew that I wanted the story to be big enough and like with a wide enough lens that people, that it would connect to things that other people, the people, uh, regular like English speakers would already know about, right? Like, I think often it's hard to like read a book about this country that you don't, like that's new, but it makes it, it's a lot easier to understand if it connects to things that are already in your brain, like, you know, memory works through repetition and association. And so if you, if you can tie it into all this other stuff, oh yeah, I know kind of about the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and I know about, and I, I know about John F. Kennedy and stuff. I really wanted the story to be global. So finding stuff that would fit into that, very global story seamlessly but also paying but also to be respectful of the the real stories that uh, were shared with me took me probably an extra two years like doing it that way took me two more years than it, it would have if i had just been like this is what we know about how Mar america is guilty or whatever um because i have basically my method was just like do lots of interview talk to everyone and see what can fit into a sort of an international picture um that would end up making sense for for a regular person but yeah i mean it was very it was like it was a lot it was like a big not you know burden it was like you know a privilege but it was uh um it's hard and like 
is a lot easier for me than it was for Sushi, and I've, as I've said before. So if it was very difficult for me psychologically, and it was, to do all of this, I can't imagine um, what it's like for people that are, are, are sort of going to be in Indonesia, be Indonesian forever, uh, have, or have a personal relationship to this. But it was, yeah, it's, uh, it's not an easy, like, uh, needle to thread. Um, and do you want to go to audience questions now or keep going um, in discussion? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I, know, I, 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 have a, I have a, yeah, is there, Suchan, have you seen a question? There's one for you that I think would be interesting. Suchan, have you seen this one? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, here about the Chinese Indonesian, yeah? I'm going to read it. May I ask what you think, uh, what do you think the impact is the impact of the 1965 to how the Chinese Indonesian community perceive and position themselves within the framework of imagination of Indonesian nationality or nationalism is quite interesting. It's quite complicated. Yeah, talking about Chinese Indonesian is quite complicated um, uh, because Chinese Indonesian is not a homogenous um, group. Yeah, and um, and in the 1965, yes, there were a lot of victims who, who can, could be identified as Chinese Indonesian. Because I never believe in the term Chinese Indonesian as permanent, as fixed. It can always be questioned. But at that time, there are a lot of people who, who was in, were in prison who could be identified as Chinese Indonesian. And uh, the Chinese Indonesians who were in prison were mainly the, the so-called Chinese who were who were taught to, and taught to means who who were not uh, mixed, who, who, who were considered not not mixed with the, uh, the the indigenous people, with the Indonesian people. Those were the ones who were more of a target. Yeah, who was who still had Chinese name, who still had um, you know, like who still had strong Chinese identity. That was the um, the target at that time. Why? Because they were related to China, to the communist China. However, this is the interesting thing. This is what I noticed. The stigma amongst the Chinese Indonesian is not actually as strong compared to the non-Chinese in Indonesia because Amongst Chinese Indonesian, they also believe that the Chinese who were in prison was not only because they were communist, but because they were Chinese. Yeah, and that's why the stigma was not as strong because they said, well, yeah, communist as well as Chinese. So at that time, my father's friends didn't actually kind of stigmatized my father that much. Although they knew, they were like, oh yeah, okay. And they just didn't talk about it, but they were still friends and they were still okay. And this is the difference between the non-Chinese because they, they were stigmatized more, you know, their friends didn't want to be friends with them. They, they were even scolded, but it, it didn't really happen with my father. Yeah. Most of his friends were okay. Also with my mother, most of my mother's friends were okay. We didn't talk about it at all. They didn't talk about it. My mom told me, well, we just don't talk about it. But they were still friends with me. My mom said like that. Only a few probably didn't want to get close to me just after your father got out of the prison because they were frightened of the implication. But after that, they were fine. They were friends. Uh, we were friends again and we were invited everywhere. Um, you know, so it, it was okay. Whereas the, the non-Chinese, sometimes they weren't invited to like uh, parties or weddings, their own relatives' weddings, you know. So uh, yes, it was in a way harder because the Chinese was, it can be said that the Chinese, Indonesian, um, they were they were doubly stigmatized because they were Chinese and then communist as well. You know, like my father, if people knew that he was uh, he had been in prison, then they said, "Oh, Chinese and communist." 
fuck that. <laughs> but at the same time, in the Chinese community, the stigma wasn't that big. So, yeah. Um, so, is there another question for me, or maybe you can you can pick your? Yeah, question. I found one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Puso the cat has a has a has a question about the role mm -hmm. of Malaysia and Singapore and all of this, which I think is interesting because it really it re leads us right um, to the role of the UK, which I think is interesting for a, a talk um, um, hosted by SOAS. So Malaysia and Singapore were very important to this entire story, um, which requires us going back a, a little bit further to 1955 when the CIA starts to really mess with um, Sukarno and the left, when they really believe that Sukarno's brand of left-leaning anti-imperialist nationalism is not an acceptable um, way for Indonesia to be run. So what they first do is they're funding money to the right wing Muslim party, Masumi, uh, hoping to stop the PKI from winning elections, which are winning, um, um, they're winning uh, more and more votes in uh, every year. That doesn't work. Um, they, the PKI just keeps doing better and better and C CIA uh, and MI6 indeed files indicate that they know that the reason the, P the PKI is doing better is because they're just sort of the, be the most organized and most trusted party among certain um, uh, uh, segments of the population. They're seen as the, less the least corrupt, which is, you know, everyone in Indonesia and most of the global south knows this is very important. Um, they really deliver on their promises. So the PKI can't be stopped by bribing other parties. In 1958, the CIA uh, covertly, secretly, launches an actual invasion of Indonesia and starts bombing the country, um, assisting so-called regional, regional rebellions, basically causing a civil war, hoping to break up the country of Indonesia. This doesn't work. But, while the, but where are these American pilots that end up dropping bombs on innocent civilians launching their flights from, from Singapore? Uh, and this becomes uh, uh, one of, not the only, but um, points of contention between Sukarno and Likanyu and um, Malaysia, uh, as it later forms, um, that um, Su Singapore has really assisted the CIA to try to destroy Indonesia in 1958. That also fails. They catch, they catch this American po pilot island pub cr crash landing into the island of Ambon. Uh, the game is up. Everybody that has been saying that the Americans can't be trusted and are trying to destroy Indonesia are proven right. Um, Arna moves closer to socialist, the socialist world internationally. But what really causes the, the um, breakdown of relations between the US again in the early 60s that leads to the mass murder is the creation of Malaysia. So Malaysia is created in such a way, Sukarno believes, that um, various bits of former British possessions are being lumped together so that the left and anti, you know, perceived anti-British forces in Southeast Asia will be weakened. Uh, he is absolutely right about that. Uh, everybody knew at the time that uh, grouping in uh, sort of what is main, mainland Malaysia with the north of Borneo, Borneo at the time was a British imperial strategy to weaken its perceived enemies. Um, and the uh, uh, Sukarno chooses to really pick a fight with Malaysia and Britain over this is called confrontation or confrontasi in Indonesian. Um, and this is the one fight he picks where he really doesn't win. He's, he's, he's taken on um, the Dutch previously, um, gotten West Papua. Uh, he believes that he maybe can take on the British in, in the case, case of opposing Malaysian, Malaysia's creation as it ends up being created. Um, Britain does not like this. Britain um, uh, uh, goes to the United States um, behind the scenes and says, hey, look, the Sukarno guy, we both know he's been a problem for a long time. This is now unacceptable. He's crossed the line. We, Britain, will continue to back your obviously kind of stupid war in Vietnam if you back us on this Malaysia thing. If you, if you really help us crush Sukarno, who... Um, uh, is now a bigger problem than we're willing to tolerate. So, uh, so when 1964, 1965 um, uh, come around, the 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 creation of covert strategy to create a clash between the Indonesian un unarmed left and the very well armed uh, army 
was engineered by the CIA and MI6. So this was a US and UK operation to uh, act in ways we still don't fully understand to create the clash that ultimately led to the mass murder of 1965 and sort of the one of the main factors for uh, the UK's involvement was protecting the process that created Malaysia in the way that it wanted it to be created. And then if you, if you want to read the International People's Tribunal that came out a few years ago in the Netherlands, uh, Britain and indeed Australia are also judged uh, um, as complicit in a wide range of crimes against humanity. Um, but yeah, the connection to Malaysia is right there. It's, that's, it's, it has to do with Britain's uh, uh, attempts, successful to, to, uh, attempts to decolonize Malaya in the way that it wanted to. And just to jump jump in there and, and add to that, um, that so so often like uh, in Brazil also the US was the kind of leader in kind of backing whatever the coup, but the British would still uh, train um, torturers and things like that, and that's in the Truth Commission report and it's on the BBC. So they would often like do a sort of you know, the grandpa, colonial grandpa, and then there's the 20th century double act. Yeah, and it was, that's really, that, like, dynamic, I think, is underappreciated. Well, some people get it if you read, like, Graham Green novels and things, but, like, mm. one, like, really simple way to summarize the relationship between CIA and MI6 in the beginning of the Cold War is that the MI6 had centuries of, like, know-how, and the Americans had, like, were stupid but had loads of money. And the the Americans had sort of an insecurity complex. They a lot of them like went to like American versions of Eaton. They went to like wannabe Eatons in um, New England, right? Uh, and they really looked up to um, MI6. And MI6 would often, you know, especially in the case of Iran, Britain, not just MI6, but Britain would push America to act in a certain way, knowing well they would they have the the guns and the money to, to do yeah. it and. Uh, yeah, like in my book, I like I focus more on the U.S. for sure because like I think that's the hegemon and like that's the yeah. country that I'm publishing the book in. But Britain is really often there, if not with like the huge pile of cash, with the know-how and the training and the strategizing, and definitely in in the case of um, Indonesia, like with the prestige media. So the BBC was really important in reproducing the lies that led to the mass murder in 1965. Um, Suja, I'm seeing some good questions that for you. Have you, have you seen any of these you want to you answer? Yeah, um, I want to answer this one actually. The, oh, the two. Okay, I'll, I'll answer this one first. I don't agree with the following. Perhaps both of us can answer this. I don't agree with the following, and the ends don't justify the means. But was there a real and valid fear as to what the communists would do? Would the communists, if they took over, lead to as many casualties and deaths means something needed to happen in Indonesia and Brazil. Does the thinking apply then and still remain today? Now, this really, um, you know, I completely disagree with this kind of thinking, of course, because, you know, you can use any ideology, yeah, to mass murder if you want. There is a nationalism, communism, uh, capitalism has killed so many people without even we without we realize it just by paying cheap labors and um you know and and um legally yeah and that's the danger of capitalism in a way they do it legally and we don't know how many victims there are we we can't even be bothered counting because all they do seems legal but people have been starving, people have been poisoned by factories and, and it's been happening, it's still happening all over the world. And it's legal. It is legal. It's legal genocide, legal mass murder under capitalism. Now back to communism, you know, you, what, you know, you can, you can murder with what? With religion, you can use religion as well. You can use anything. And please remember, um, what happened in Indonesia, I, I saw it not just between communism, you know, not, not just between East and West. The, the CIA, the American big companies, actually, what they wanted was Papua as well. 
Yeah. Because Papua was really rich. It's the money, actually, the wealth in Papua that they wanted. So they, they, they didn't really care, actually, if communism was there, as long as they sided with them. If communism gave Papua to them, then they would say, oh, yeah, pop communism was fine. And um, in Indonesia, they like to say, oh, look at what happened to, in, in Russia, China, and interesting, interestingly, they also mentioned Cambodia, yeah? Uh, Cambodia, Pol Pot, they say, look at what happened to Pol Pot. And actually, it's the other way around because Pol Pot, and again, I don't justify this. <laughs> so after Pol Pot heard what happened in Indonesia in 1965, was one of the reasons in a way that made him carry out the genocide of non-communist people in Cambodia. I don't justify this, but you can see that here, it's actually the other way around, yeah? The genocide in Indonesia, we can say that the genocide in Indonesia had a role in pushing Pol Pot to do the genocide in Cambodia, yeah? So, yeah. Yeah, and the Communist Party in Indonesia at that time, they were, they were actually, uh, they had this approach of non-violent, of um, being, being cooperative with the government. So they had no plan of doing the coup at all. This kind of excuse only came up later when they started to do the mass murder, then they started doing the propaganda and saying, if we don't kill, then we will be killed. Yeah, that's what happened then. Yeah. Maybe Vincent can add something. Yeah, I'd love to. I think I think that you did a great job. I think this is, uh, the question is like, based on poor assumptions, but it's also really important to answer it because like those assumptions are almost built into uh, the way we understand the world. And so I, I always think it's good to, to answer this question. I'm grateful someone got asked it. So two parts. One, as Su Chen said, anybody can justify whatever they want by saying, if we didn't do that, they were going to do something worse, right? Like, again, you know, the Nazis said this, everyone's going to, anybody that, that is going, that has done horrible atrocities, you can bet if you look, they told themselves or told everyone else, oh, we had to do this or something else was going to happen. If, if the speculative theoretical <laughs> assertion that um, crimes against humanity are always justified uh, or are justified when I think that someone else might do them, then we're gonna have a lot of crimes against humanity on planet earth. But just historically and um, looking at the case of the Indonesian Communist Party in the regional context and the global context, there's very little reason to believe that a ultimately successful um, takeover of the country by the Indonesian Communist Party would have ever led to something like this. I mean, so if you look at the case, if you look at what the Communist Party was in Indonesia, what its ideology was, and even the cases that of much more hardline um, parties taking over, you just didn't get anything um, much like what, 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 um, what Suharto ended up doing. So first of all, they were, they were for a very long time, uh, an unarmed moderate party that just wanted to participate in parliamentary democracy. So I think the question, the real question is not to ask, is not, to ask is not what happens if in 1965, after all these this these um, simmering pressures explode, what if one side wins? I think the right question to ask is what happens if you allow throughout the 1950s parliamentary democracy to exist as it um, was intended uh, and just allow the Indonesian Communist Party to do pretty well, but to not control everything. Um, that was what was unacceptable to the United States. And that was what led us down the path to violent conflict in 1965. But even if you could somehow imagine the, the PKI coming out of 65 with full hegemony and doing like a communist revolution, um, uh, two things, one, their ideology was that socialism should be implemented 40 to 50 years later. They, they believed that they believe they were sort of the, an old school Marxist party and that they believed that their job was to help in the establishment of capitalism alongside the national bourgeoisie and then later transition to socialism, they said in the year 2000, more or less. But then if we look at just like, look over at Vietnam and Cambodia, the countries, um, you know, geographically and temporally uh, situated, in proximity in Indonesia, um, Vietnam, after a third, you know, Vietnam, the communist, the communist party of Vietnam was definitely radicalized by 
30 years of war with France and then the United States. They did not in 1975 take over with some kind of a purge of a million people. It was, you know, it was, things were not great in Vietnam from 1975 to 1979, but um, they certainly like that it did not happen there. Uh, and this was a much more militarized party. And number two, the case of Cambodia is really instructive because not only, as Su Chen said, did Cambodia radicalize because they were so afraid of what had happened in Indonesia, the horrible things that took place under the Khmer Rouge um, in Pol Pot uh, were stopped by the Vietnamese Communist Party. And then in 1979, when the Vietnamese Communist Party, or the Vietnam as a, you know, the, new, the new country of Vietnam, invaded Cambodia to overthrow Pol Pot, stop, you know, uh, liberate Cambodians from the killing fields, tell the world about what was happening in Cambodia. What did the United States do? They didn't turn around and say, oh, that's great. Uh, we are opposed to mass murder committed by the left. No, they encouraged the China to invade Vietnam as punishment for getting involved in Cambodia. And then the United States was explicitly backing and uh, uh, keeping alive the Khmer Rouge from 1979 to the end of the Cold War. So the United States took the side of the Khmer Rouge, um, despite the fact that they had done by far the worst thing that a, that a putatively left-wing movement um, had done in Southeast Asia. And even then, what Suharto did uh, in East Timor was worse than what came, uh, happened in Pol Pot. So Suharto, when he took over East Timor using, again, anti-communism as justification, he, he killed a larger percentage of people then, um, died under Pol Pot, got the big, uh, 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 you know, I think they call it the big wink, but, you know, got the full backing, if not explicit, certainly concrete from the United States and Australia to, to do that. Um, so the idea that something worse would have happened than this, if, if, if the moderate unarmed communist party that had been winning elections for 15 years had been able to take over. It's just, it's just not borne out by facts. And even if it were, and I think it really isn't, even if it were, that wouldn't justify mass murder because then everybody gets to kill everyone anytime they think that the bad guys are getting close to power. Yeah. Yeah, do you wanna add anything, Yera? Well, I was just gonna add, I suppose, thinking about the Brazilian context mm. um, that I think, yeah, a lot of people were and are scared of communism, like my granddad, yeah. um, who who is like he actually turned a hundred this year, wow. um, and he he's yeah he's a, a well off white Brazilian in São Paulo. Of course, he's scared of communism, mm. um, and I think it's important to you can sometimes accept that people's fear is real, yeah. but still criticize it and yeah. still have a kind of materialist analysis of it. It's just class interests, and particularly in the Brazilian context. I think it's important to remember that Brazil has, like Vincent points out in his book, a kind of innate anti-communist class or feeling um, because it's a settler colony. Um, and we can certainly link it to that, right? It's a, it's a colony that was based in genocide of indigenous people, um, in, like forced migration and slavery of, you know, up to 5 million African people um, and was, was still like a slave state until like all, all, almost the turn of the 20th century. So it's important to, you, you might well meet people who are genuinely anti-communist and scared, but it's important, that doesn't make it okay for them to violently act on those fears. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually fear is quite effective in this case, yeah? To control people. I, I just saw one question which may be interested, uh, which may, may be interesting for all of us actually. This one, can you talk a bit about the necessary, it's up there. Uh, can you talk a bit about the necessary interplay between official killers mm. and unofficial killers, the paramilitary, Pemuda Pancasila, organized crime. What I found particularly fascinating about the Jakarta method was the recurrence of the officials relying on the unofficial actors for the actual killing not just in Indonesia, but in other instances of leftist mass killings as well. Why does this collusion recur in these many instances and how do the different groups benefit from this collusion? Do you want to answer that first, Vincent? Yeah, I'm yeah. glad you saw that one because I want to do that one as well. So mm -hmm. this is an important dynamic in Indonesia, but also across um, the Cold War, right? So like um, in, in Indonesia, 
the the way that the murders were actually carried out varied from area to area. That 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 question talks about Pamunda Panchasila, which is probably he got or he or she got from act of killing because in Sumatra uh, that that was quite important. But in other parts of Indonesia was different. In in it was different groups in Bali. It was different groups in Central Java. But as a really general rule, what you would say is that it wasn't the soldiers that were plunging the knife into the into the flesh or throwing people into rivers. It was often local, um, the word translates just as sort of assassins, uh, that they would that they would that they would make use of people that they kind of pressured into uh, doing this, or that they kind of thought would be up for doing it, or that they could threaten into doing. And there's some there's some chilling um, accounts that like even the people that like were up for participating in this had to like deaden their senses with alcohol afterwards, even in very Muslim organizations. And then, of course, in Central America, South America, we know all about death squads, right? People that like want to go further of, above and beyond what the military is doing, but with the active support of the military. So like one of the most famous is like the AAA in Argentina, which is formed actually before the really bad dictatorship, the Delhi dictatorship is formed. Um, and this is an important dynamic, I think, for two reasons. Again, both, both these reasons are speculative, but one... I think it works, right? I think it, it, it's effective to have another group which is acting a little bit sub-officially that has a little bit more, that gives the officials a little bit more um, ability to plausibly deny that this is going on. Um, uh, and you get some, some real radicals or sort of kind of the people that you wouldn't even want in your military because they're really like the real sick, you know, people, you know, the people that are really like willing to do it. And, and what I found a lot of, in my research, a lot of the people that even like celebrated the arrival of violence when it got there, they didn't like what they had unleashed. Like it's really hard for people to do this. So to sort of outsource it to the most desperate and depraved parts of society, I think like is, is effective. Um, and, and yeah, I guess, I guess what's the, it's the second one is that is that we do we do see the reproduction and this is a point that I try to make in my book all the time. It's not just the left and the communists that we're an international movement. We do see the reproduction of tactics from country to country. Um, things that kind of worked here are imported over here, and death squads are trained and formed by people that have expertise from this part of the world. And I outlined the Jakarta method like. John Russo, the historian, believes that disappearances were first used in Asia uh, in 1965 and 66. And then Greg Grandin, the historian in Latin America, believes that the exact same tactic was used in 1966 in Guatemala. Um, and US officials like moved exactly from that, that region to the other region at that time. So it's strongly suggestive that maybe they brought over this tactic with them. So um, I think that you see this proliferate for two reasons. One, it works, and two, because officials, including US officials or uh, anti-communist international organizations, bring them from country to country uh, and, and, and sort of copy what's been effective, horribly effective elsewhere. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And, you know, by, by involving the paramilitary in this case, by involving the people, the, civ the so-called civilian, you know, the paramilitary, uh, in a way they're civilians, right? <laughs> In a way, they make these uh, stigmatized people, the the, the people, you know, the people that they're aiming, as the enemy of the people. Yeah. So the, the communists become becomes the enemy of the people. So it's not between the military or, for instance, Suharto against the communists. No, it's communists against the people, and it works because when you involve the civilians, then in a way, everyone is involved. Everyone is either against or not, yeah? So either you are the communist or you are the ones either murdering or implicated in the murder of the communists. So this really can, this can really divide the society. And that's why this can sustain the stigma. It's very effective. And this was used also by Hitler. 
you know, when uh, Kristallnacht, I don't know whether you, you've ever heard of it, Kristallnacht, when, when there were like um, a group of people attacking the Jewish shops. And actually, they were just Hitler's people pretending to be civilians. And that happened in Indonesia. You know, some military pretend to, pretended to be civilians and then they involved civilians and then more and more civilians were involved. And in the end, the paramilitary uh, had uh, so much power. And in the end, you create a society where, it's, where it is the, the communist or against the communist, not non-communist, but against the communist. So this is the, the, the very effective strategy for me. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll jump in real quickly to say that the, that certain of the, some of the death squads in Indonesia were inspired by Hitler. So the uh, yeah. armed wing of NU, the Muslim organization that helped carry out a lot of the killings in central Java was named Banser, mm -hmm. but like, the leader said that he he liked that it rhymed with Ponser because he'd been reading Mein Kampf and he was yeah, yeah. he liked the way that uh, the the Germans had dealt with the communists. So again, like this is all people they learn from each other. This, these these tactics are reproduced mm -hmm. over and over. Um, I saw a question. I don't know if Suchen, you want to take this one. Um, could you please discuss the role of the arts, visual art, music, theater, literature, in remembering '65 and empowering survivors? I thought this might be one that you. Yes. A lot. <laughs> okay. So uh, th that's why arts is very important. Yeah. And in Indonesia, it's quite funny because if people are doing art, they say, my God, what are you doing? You're doing something useless. Yeah. So anything in, in relation to art, people will just look down on them. Yeah. They just say, oh, you know, literature, whatever, arts, not important. It's engineering. Yes, that's important. But actually, during the 1965, a lot of artists were in prison. So there was a group of artists called Lekra that was linked to the communist, the, the Indonesian Communist Party. And a lot of the artists were imprisoned and even murdered. And then they replaced these artists. Before then, actually, there was already a conflict between the, the so-called left-wing artists and the, the ones who were, who, opposed to the left-wing, to these left-wing artists. And um, this left, the, the, the non-left-wing artists um, wrote a letter criticizing the left-wing artists and this group was actually in the end banned by Sukarno. Okay, so Sukarno was quite authoritarian as well at that time. And then after 1965, lots of these, these left-wing artists were murdered in prison. And then there was a group of the new artists who did not touch anything about socialism and Marxism. And even if they touch anything about socialism, socialism and Marxism, they stigmatize this, yeah? Communism, Marxism, socialism, what is Leninism? They're all the same. Atheism, they're all the same in Indonesia. They're the same and the bad, the evil. And most of the writings say this and also the paintings, the arts basically. Yeah. And what was quite interesting was um, during the new order, um, abstract paintings and abstract poems were really popular. Why? Because when you, you know, some say something so abstract, you don't really know sometimes who you criticize, right? So abstract that it's just <laughs> up there. Whereas if you criticize the government, then you have to be somehow more kind of real. Yeah. And that's why the abstract painting, the abstract poems about love, about some philosophical ideas of, you know, uh, discussing like um, existentialism, something like that, without touching you know, so they, they talk about existentialism, but without touching <laughs> Marxism or anything like that. So, um, for instance, this is the funny thing. Um, Animal Farm by, um, oh, who's the author of Animal Farm? George Orwell, yeah. Orwell. Orwell was quite left wing, yeah. But suddenly they could pick Animal Farm that criticizes communism 
and then that's it. They translated uh, this animal farm in Indonesia and it's such a huge number. And actually I had to read it as well. But yeah. they, they, they never mentioned 1984 or any other writings of George yeah. Orwell. So that, that's what they did. Yeah, I think it's, sorry, just to jump in, I have to mention that Animal Farm was actually translated and distributed in Indonesia by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was the front organization set up by the CIA that like, yeah, if you yeah. just want to Google, if you can just Google Congress for Cultural Freedom, they warped the 20th century art world in ways that are still really hard to comprehend. But yeah, it was, they were the ones that, that, that pumped Animal Farm throughout Indonesia. And yeah, it's really interesting for you to say that uh, they, they, they made sure to get that one out there, but not Orwell's other works. It's, that's really interesting. Yeah, and 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 the the people who were kind of like opposed to the um, left wing writers and whatever they become quite famous. And um, one of them was, you know, one of the most famous author in 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 Surabaya, in my city. Uh, his name is Budi Dharma. And at one point, uh, when we discuss Pramudya Anantatur, he just said, "Oh, but he's a communist," just like that. Yeah. So they're still really against the, the, the so-called left-wing authors, although the, these authors had been persecuted, but they still stigmatize them. It's just unbelievable sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, the way Animal Farm is deployed uh, in the UK and US is also really funny. Um, I wanted to, before we finish, I wanted to end, I've picked this question very selfishly because I relate to it, um, but also because I, I guess I wanted to end maybe in like a forward facing, like hopeful uh, point um, as well, like no. Um, so this question, um, for Indonesians in their 20s like me, because of what So Chen described before as the internalized fear and with limited access to discussions around the event and limited history education, the 1965 stories are just unreachable for most of us. Sad that I just recently found out that my grandfather was labeled as C2, a member of organizations that aligned vision with the PKI after 1965 and received a lot of discrimination afterwards. So thank you for sharing that with us. And then it goes on, what I want to say is alternative sources about the event and what actually happened, like your works, are extremely important for us. My question, what do you think we can do to continue reproducing alternative narratives about 1965 to counter the narrative that's strongly made up by authority, especially targeting the young generation, say third and fourth generation, um, to be involved in this conversation? So I'll answer really quickly and yeah, like you can, you can do it first. You can answer. I'll, I'll answer glibly and 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 selfishly, and then I'll give Sutra the the bigger answer. Um, you know, like, Mar like support what Marjan Kiri Marjan Kiri is doing over the next six, like months. Like they're being very brave and taking a real risk and putting out uh, Sutra's book and ho hopefully mm -hmm. mine as well. Like, but like they're doing it and like it's tough now with. For the, it's tough for the Indonesian military now, and I can sense that they're, they know this, that it's tough with sort of documents being dumped by the US government and like Wikipedia telling the truth and like these uh, works like ours being summarized and reproduced in the major US media, it's tough for them to really insist that it's, that their version is right. Um, so to just, you know, in, you know, uh, it's in, in, insist that these aren't even alternative sources, that this is the real, you know, it's the, it's the mainstream truth. It's based on really hard stuff and don't, you know, I'll help Marjan Kiri to, and, and anybody else that's sort of struggling in a more personal way than I am to establish that, no, this is actually the real story, not the, the counter story. Uh, but Su Chen, you're, you're, you're a lot closer to this, this struggle. So what would you say? I said that spread the word, yeah? Like what you said, spread the word and ask them to think logically because, you know, the, the excuse is, oh, you know, we don't, we don't have um, facility. We don't know the truth. Whereas the, uh, the history, the, the, the government, the new order version of history is everywhere. So that's the excuses. But 
if you just think logically, the version of the history is actually so illogical. Yeah, so for instance, um, Sukarno, there was a, a coup against Sukarno, and then Suharto was uh, the one, uh, you know, trying to save the country from the coup. But then why Suharto became the president, not Sukarno, you know? If there's a coup against Sukarno by the Communist Party, then Sukarno had to keep being the president, right? So again, you know, it just, that's, that doesn't make sense. Secondly, um, if the, the Indonesian Communist Party was about to uh, carry out the coup, then they would have been ready with weapons, right? And you must remember that the Indonesian Communist Party at that time was the third largest in the world outside of China and Russia. The members were um, about uh, over three million and um, they, they were the majority as well, yeah, political party. And, and if they were ready with the coup, would there be mass killing and mass imprisoning like that easily? No. Yeah, there would be civil war, a, a bloody and long civil war. So it was impossible. So just by thinking logically, that history is impossible. It just, it doesn't make sense. And if you want to go further, if you want to go to the museum and check, um, about the new order version of history that states that the, um, the genitals, uh, were mutilated by Gurwani women, by the left-wing women, and that their eyeballs were plucked by the left-wing women. You should go to the museum there, see the photos of the um, genitals corpses, and you'll see that the eyeballs are intact on the photo, yeah? And you see they're still wearing trousers, no blood there on the penis or anything, no. So yeah, I mean, after, after some, for, for God's sake, if someone has been, uh, you know, if someone's penis has been mutilated, there should be blood somewhere. Yeah, at least you could see some blood on the trousers or anything, no blood at all on the trousers. So you can just think logically and you'll know that this version of history is stupid and you know, just spread the word, please. Spread the word that this is just, this just doesn't make sense. Yeah, do you want to add anything? Um, well, I guess uh, we're thinking of wrapping up now. So just say thank you to everyone who's come and for your questions and your comments. And we can't get through all the questions, unfortunately. Um, and, and I guess to say that I found it very powerful reading both your books, um, I guess because, uh, Suchen, like your story, uh, like my mum lived in the, during the dictatorship in Brazil and resisted it, but also doesn't really talk to me about it. And then Vincent, part of the Brazil bit of your book, we started WhatsApping about. Um, so yeah, I found it very powerful and I think that, um, like the last person who asked a question said there is a generation of young people who are like out here talking about this, talking about, uh, the origins a long time ago and what's happened in the 20th century and doing all kinds of storytelling from like YouTube videos to memes to novels. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm hopeful and yeah, thank you everybody. Yeah, I'll just, add, just also say thank you so much for anybody that took the time to, to come to this or uh, took the time to read any, either of our books or the three of our books or, or feel like doing so in the future. But yeah, just really, I'm really um, humbled and, and grateful for, for anybody's interest in all this, all this work. Yeah, and if you're doing, uh, if you're in Indonesia doing activism, like you can at Vincent and Sochen and they'll share it and get it out there as well. All right, thank you so much then.